I want to take a moment to tell you about the chair, the Ralph S. Tyler Jr. Professorship. Uh, the story begins 50 years ago when Harvard Law School began planning, planning for its 150th anniversary. Preview, we're planning for our 200th, which is next year. Ralph Tyler was a member of the Harvard Law School Association. He was the class of 1930. He gave a gift, and the gift grew. And the gift, uh, he wanted to actually support a scholar in constitutional law. The first holder of the chair was John Hart Ely. Not bad. Um, their subsequent uh, holders of the chair have been Larry Tribe, uh, Richard Fallon. When Tyler specified that this is the field he wanted uh, to honor, I'm not sure exactly why, other than I just have to note, he played a governance role himself in the railroad industry and on the visiting committee of Harvard Law School. So he thought about governance. Adrian Vermeule well, is a graduate of the Harvard Law School, but he went west. Why was that? He went to the University of Chicago and we then had to woo him back. And it took time, and we are just so thrilled. Now, when I say back, it's not only because he was a student here. He grew up in Cambridge. And I have to say a word about that, because his parents were distinguished academics here. His father, Cornelius, a scholar of ancient art and curator of classical art at the Museum of Fine Arts. His mother, Emily, was herself just an extraordinarily uh, accomplished professor of philology and archaeology, and one of the very few women in all of Harvard when I joined the faculty. And to her, I am very grateful, because I didn't get a lot of warm welcomes, and she gave me one. <laughs> His sister, Blakely, teaches English at Stanford. And Adrian recounts the challenge that he faced when he said to his parents that he wanted to go to law school. I'm quoting Adrian. They said, they reacted in horror, as if I wanted to repair refrigerators for a living, as if it were a sort of vocational thing. He has made it so much more than that. A 1990 graduate of Harvard College, magna graduate of Harvard Law School in 1993, he was a law clerk for Judge David Santel of the US Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit, and then one of the most favorite clerks, I think I can say that, of Associate Justice Antonin Scalia, also a graduate of the school. He has authored eight books. His research ranges across all things public law, administrative law, the administrative state, the design of institutions, constitutional law, constitutional theory, the structure of public law. A prolific contributor to law reviews, he frequently appears in any list of top-ranking professors for the numbers of papers downloaded from the Social Science Research Network and for his influence. He also writes extensively for the popular press, the New York Times, the New Republic, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and last year, he helped to launch and now co-edits a really fascinating online review books, The New Rambler. And his uh, co-conspirators include his sister, Blakely, and uh, who, uh, Eric Posner from the University of Chicago. The New Rambler covers the range of, of issues of, that any intellectual ought to be in touch with. And it takes its name from Samuel Johnson's periodical, The Rambler. Just a word on Adrian's scholarship. His uh, many, many books. I, I cannot talk about them all. I just want to comment on one book, The Constitution of Risk, um, which Thomas Poole at the London School of Economics and Political Science said cements Adrian's reputation as one of the most distinctive and important voices in contemporary constitutional theory. In that book, Adrian puts aside what he calls first order risks, uh, posed by things like health, environmental, consumer, product regulation, and instead identifies higher order risks arising from institutional failure. Uh, ranging from separation of powers and structure of government, free speech, reasonable doubt, and criminal law, not to say that you were prescient, <laughs> but the risks that we do face in the entire structure is something that you thought about very powerfully. Uh, his uh, contributions to the casebook on administrative law with other distinguished people is well known, and he will talk today about a new book published this week Laws, abnegation, and I promise not to spill the beans, so you'll hear more very soon. This event is co-sponsored wonderfully by our library, and let me just note, the book is available for sale. 
Uh, I could talk on and on about many of the other books, but that's just not fair because I don't want to take any more time from uh, Adrian. But let me just close by quoting a few other people. I did a little crowdsourcing here uh, about Adrian. Jack Goldsmith says, Adrian is the smartest and most learned person I know. Adrian is enormously efficient. It takes him about three months to write a book. <laughs> Jack recalls serving on the Chicago Hiring Committee when Adrian was on the market and said, I interviewed him, I was very impressed, I came back to Chicago and Cass asked me about the candidates and I told him one stood out and I gave him Adrian's favorite, famous paper on Holy Trinity. Cass, in his inimitable way, read it in 10 minutes. <laughs> he came back to my office and said, this guy is brilliant, we have to hire him. Cass himself says, I would simply say he is the very best public law scholar in the United States, which means that he is the best public law scholar in the world. And has also been members. <laughs> see? See? I heard it. See? And uh, Cass also remembers that Justice Scalia called him up and said, I have never pushed a single candidate in all my years on the court. And this is someone you should hire. Hire him. And Cass went on to say, the easiest and best hiring decision I've ever been involved with. Aren't we lucky that Adrian is here? Actually, that Cass is here. We're just going to move everybody here. Um, and after this evening lecture, I hope that you join me for a reception. But right now, join me in uh, recognizing and saluting Adrian Vermeule, the Ralph S. Tyler Jr. Professor of Constitutional Law. And I instantly got two hate mails from refrigerators <laughs> who said that this was, you know, raw and elitism, uh, which, to which I plead guilty uh, and apologies. They were, they were right. Um, but I blame my parents. Okay. Um, Martin, thank you so much. Um, I can't thank you enough for your support for my research and teaching, including the seminars we've talked together about public law. I'm very deeply appreciative. Um, and I also want to take a special moment to acknowledge my wife, Yunsu, who's here today. Uh, the second acknowledgement, but the first, first of my heart. And this book uh, is a joint product. All my books are a joint product. So what I do is I put her name on the dedication page of all my books. I want to thank you uh, for everything. Um, and, and last but not least, let me thank uh, the many friends and colleagues who contributed comments and suggestions uh, to the book. Uh, both uh, Cass and Jake uh, kindly adapt some of material from our joint projects into the book. Uh, was very, uh, very kind and very helpful. Um, and a special thanks to Cass for getting me out of the hiring pool at the University of Chicago. I think my next best offer hovered between nothing and Hofstra. So uh, I'm glad I got a job. Thank you. Um, OK, uh, so the thanks are the important stuff. Um, and now. I just want to um, uh, give some details, uh, which is uh, the book's thesis and its major claims. Um, the subtitle is From Law's Empire to the Administrative State. And I think it's obvious for those who know the legal philosopher Ronald Dworkin uh, what the frame of the book is and who the target of the book might be. Um, you know, Dworkin famously said that <clears throat> courts are the heartland of law's empire and judges are its princes. Um, and this is a, a claim that has irked me for, <laughs> for decades, I suppose, <laughs> ever since I started in law school. Um, so the book is, in, in some sense, an attempt to, to undermine uh, this thesis. And I start with the following observation about working, is that he was nearly completely oblivious to the administrative state. I mean, almost totally oblivious to it. So if you read his stuff, uh, he works with a schematic set of stylized institutions, the courts and legislatures, occasionally mentions administrative agencies um, in the way my parents mentioned refrigerator repair as kind of, uh, you know, just uh, uh, 
sort of technicians, and has no account of how the administrative state fits into his claim about law's empire and his vision of uh, courts as the heartland of law's empire. Well, I, I don't think this is just a kind of curious work in fact. I think it's a, uh, uh, turns out to be a serious problem for Dworkin for the following reason. If you look around at Anglo-American legal systems, you will see that um, they have uh, strikingly, all or almost all, at least the major ones, evolved some version of a principle of deference to reasonable administrative decision making. So this turns out to be a common ground. Now it takes different forms in different uh, versions of the Anglo-American legal, legal systems uh, across parliamentary and, and, and presidential systems, but, um, but there's some kind of common core there. And uh, that principle of uh, deference to reasonable administrative decision making, which is deeply woven into the fabric of case law in these legal systems, uh, pits uh, some of Dworkin's commitments against each other. Uh, particularly, um, it puts into tension uh, Dworkin's commitment to the idea that there are, uh, in principle, right answers, even in hard cases, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the principle of law's integrity, that is, the law has a component of uh, fit and justification that uh, is embedded within evolving case law, not simply uh, abstractly rational. The reason that this kind of consensus development of uh, principle of deference to reasonable agency interpretations puts these uh, commitments into tension with each other arises when we ask uh, what a judge should do about a reasonable agency decision um, that may or may not correspond to what the judge thinks is actually the correct answer about what the law should be. Um, and we see that uh, Dworkin is then put to a, a kind of tough choice uh, between two things. One, one thing would be to reject the principle of deference to reach reasonable agency decisions and have judges decide the right answer for themselves that would, I think, severely threaten the law's integrity commitment because it would be out of step with the uh, unmistakable thrust of uh, the development of law in Anglo-American legal systems. It would be a kind of radical move that uh, would fail on the dimension of fit. The other expedient, I think, is to say that, uh, and this is a kind of nominal reconciliation, is to say that um, the right answer just is that agencies can decide uh, within the boundaries of the reasonable. That preserves the kind of nominal sovereignty of law's empire uh, while draining it of its substance. That is, what it drains away is Dworkin's um, commitment, as David Dissenhaus puts it, uh, to the idea that courts have a monopoly on legal interpretation. It's a heartland vision of courts as, uh, and judges as the princes of law's empire. Um, so this is the tension with which I open the book, and then what the book tries to do is to exploit this tension uh, throughout and to develop the thesis that public law, at least in the United States, has voluntarily um, uh, uh, abandoned or abnegated law's empire. That is, um, public law, by which I mean administrative law and relevant sectors of constitutional law that bear on the structure of government, has voluntarily chosen uh, an ever-expanding deference towards uh, reasonable agency decision-making in areas of fact, of policy, even of uh, legal interpretation itself. And uh, this is where I... Uh, <clears throat> Do Mark Tushnet always accuses me of uh, doing perverse legal scholarship? So <laughs> this is uh, this is very much in that vein. What I try to do is to build up this thesis in a Dworkinian way. That is, it's a strictly internal legal argument that uh, goes through area after area and tries to build up uh, through fit and justification the thesis that a uh, law has. <laughs> abnegated its uh, imperial pretensions. So I show with respect to agency procedure, with respect to rationality review of agency decision making drawn on my joint work with Jake, 
uh, legal interpretation, and, and all sorts of other areas, uh, how this process occurs and how the boundaries of law have steadily contracted. Now, um, I mentioned the nominal reconciliation, and I want to uh, pause on that for a second. It remains true in American public law, and the Supreme Court says this emphatically, especially when its authority is challenged, the Supreme Court says emphatically that courts retain the power and duty to say what the law is. The trick, if you like, um, or the move uh, that reconciles that principle with uh, this kind of ever-expanding abnegation of law's authority is that uh, deciding what the law is, judges go on to decide that the law itself requires deference. And this becomes explicitly the um, rationale uh, for the Meade decision in 2001 that explains uh, why it is uh, compatible with our traditional legal commitments to defer to agencies on uh, uh, reasonable legal interpretations. The consequence of all this is, uh, as I said, to leave judges in possession of a kind of nominal, uh, a kind of nominal sovereignty. So my somewhat snarky comparison in the book is to the place of the Queen of England in the you know, UK legal system. So uh, from the standpoint of law, uh, the Queen in Parliament is the uh, still the sovereign in the English legal system um, and has absolute uh, theoretical authority to command and to proscribe. In fact, what happens is that a convention has evolved such that uh, the queen is deemed to have uh, considered the matter and always decided to follow the advice of her ministers from the House of Commons. Uh, and this is the kind of um, uh, semantic reconciliation between legal sovereignty and an actual transfer of decision-making authority uh, that we see, um, I think, in the Meade decision. Now, I'm overstating, deliberately overstating things a bit for fun. That is, of course, this process of abnegation is a kind of now and not yet. It's an ongoing process, um, incomplete, in the sense that judges retain power in US public law to enforce the outer boundaries of statutory clarity, uh, to review agency decisions for rationality, um, and to review agency procedural decisions. But the bulk of the book is an attempt to show how far the process has gone. That is, that um, even a conventional wisdom among academics, even administrative law academics, underestimates uh, the degree uh, to which law has uh, retreated, in my sense, um, and underestimates um, the degree of abnegation that's occurred. So again, to recur to the uh, work on rationality review, with Jake, uh, one thing we found is that uh, that kind of conventional wisdom about hard look review uh, simply does not capture the operating rules of the legal system uh, so far as we can make it. Now, um, <clears throat> let me say a word about the baseline against which this process of abnegation might be measured, because I think we do need some baseline, otherwise or kind of have a claim that's somewhat hanging in the air. We could imagine um, a, a hypothetical legal system, a kind of possible world in which the law is even more uh, deferential to the administrative state than it is today. That is, we could imagine a regime in which uh, rule, rules of reviewability are uh, more restrictive uh, than they are now, that there's a you could imagine a presumption against reviewability, such that it's very hard to get cases into court. You could imagine an even more restrictive doctrine of standing uh, than we have now, and so on and on. And in this legal system, we would say that uh, uh, the, the current legal system appears um, uh, you know, highly uh, legalist and intrusive. So relative to this hypothetical benchmark, our system would look <coughs> extremely legalistic. I say in the book that I don't think from a Dworkinian perspective that's the right way to think about these matters. That is, a comparison of uh, possible worlds is not the right procedure. I think the right procedure is to start with uh, a doctrinal and historical benchmark and ask about the law's uh, path uh, 
away from that benchmark and, and to ask what principles and what precedents the laws evolved relative to that benchmark. So the structure of the book, uh, and this explains my baseline, is to start with the great case of Crowell versus Benson in 1932, which tried to lay out a kind of peace treaty or line of demarcation between um, the administrative state and the claims of law. And I see some of my ad law students here who are smiling, we go, oh no, <laughs> Crowell versus Benson again. Um, so, and then the structure of the book is to show how the elements of the Crowell compromise or peace treaty between law and the administrative state have all come undone. They've come, come unglued, if you like. And there's been a kind of destabilization of this peace treaty. And I claim that in every case, the peace treaty has been stabilized and destabilized in the same direction. That is, the movement off the Crowell baseline has invariably been towards greater and greater deference to administrative authority. Um, I won't do this in detail, but I do want to uh, just discuss um, the question of uh, legal interpretation by agencies just to show the key mechanism that I think causes this uh, expansion, relentless expansion of deference. So Crowell uh, distinguished between law and fact and said that questions of law were for the courts, de novo, with no deference to administrative interpretation. Uh, and as to fact, it said agencies would get deferences to fact subject to substantial evidence review. Well, uh, those two halves of the Crowell opinion um, offered very different rationales, so different that David Curry, my former colleague at the University of Chicago, called Crowell a schizophrenic opinion. He said that in one part of Crowell it emphasized uh, agency expertise, efficiency, um, and other institutional desiderata, and that was to justify deference on questions of fact. And then suddenly Crowell switched gears and said, but we can't have deference on questions of law because that would create a government of a bureaucratic character alien to our system. Okay? The process by which abnegation occurs in the decades after Crowell is, I believe, that the first set of rationales, the ones that justify deferences to questions of fact, start to, as it were, spill over the levy wall between fact and law and expand throughout the landscape and become cited to justify uh, first, uh, deference uh, as to fact in Crowell, then in Hearst in 1944, deference on mixed questions of fact and law, a category I've never understood. I uh, can't make any sense of it. Uh, and in Hearst, <clears throat> like the first appearance of the light motif in a symphony, you hear the, the following thing, and I'm going to quote, they say, the agency will get deference on mixed questions of fact and law so long as it has a reasonable basis in law. And that idea of a reasonable basis in law is the first appearance of the light motif that later swells into the Chevron decision in 1984, which uh, comes full out and says, yes, we will defer to re reasonable agency legal interpretations for the same sorts of institutional reasons that were cited in Crowell to justify deference as to questions of fact. And as I said in the Meade decision after Chevron, uh, there's a kind of attempt to salve the conscience of the traditional lawyer by saying, well, uh, uh, judges decide what the law is, but the law itself requires deference. Um, I have no quarrel with that so long as we understand what the, what the consequence is, that um, the uh, judicial uh, power to say what the law is is exercised in a, in a self abnegating way. Um, you see how it goes. The book uh, runs through this narrative in area after area, first to establish this advocatory <coughs> process of work. I want uh, to discuss one other uh, claim of the book, uh, which is uh, central to the quarrels I have with uh, critics of the administrative state, like Philip Hamburger and uh, Gary Lawson, uh, that I think is a corollary of what I just said. Um, this other claim goes like this. Um, there is a competing narrative to the narrative of abnegation that I try to sketch. And uh, uh, we might call the competing narrative the narrative of betrayal. So on the narrative of betrayal, 
which uh, students seem to imbibe very quickly when they get to law school. I'm not sure how it occurs. Uh, but on the narrative of betrayal, the administrative state represents a kind of uh, betrayal uh, of the Constitution. That is, at a certain point, and the critics interestingly disagree about when this point occurs. Sometimes it's World War II, sometimes World War I, sometimes 1887, the creation of the Interstate Commerce Commission, uh, sometimes 1937, of course. Uh, but at some point, um, the institutions of government betray their charter. They license the fusion of executive uh, and judicial powers, the fusion of executive and legislative powers, um, and create an institutional system that's out of step uh, with the original constitutional framework. And their prescription is a kind of renewal of constitutional virtue and a return, if possible, to the Constitution of 1789. And, and some of them, like Lawson, are quite clear that that may not be possible, but they want us at least to feel bad about it. <laughs> that is, to have a kind of intellectual hangover uh, about um, modern administrative law. Well. Um, I don't think this is the right way to think about the process of abnegation. Um, and to explain why, I cite in the book a, a quotation from a French president, uh, Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, uh, who was asked, uh, after, there were wild political upheavals in France in 1968, and someone asked Giscard d'Estaing, well, can we return to the situation before 1968? And he said something that was, I thought, pretty clever, at least for a president. Um, his part he said, um, there's no question of returning to the pre-1968 situation, if only for the reason that the pre-1968 situation included the conditions that led to 1968. So this is my fundamental quarrel with the narrative of betrayal. That is, the narrative of betrayal is interestingly silent about why exactly it is the administrative state comes in, uh, into being. It's as though it looms ominously over the Constitution uh, without much of a, a genesis story. Well, how did it come into being? It's not as though the administrative state was imposed on our constitutional order uh, in the same way that a new constitution was imposed on the Japanese uh, uh, polity in 1945. It wasn't imposed by an external force. Uh, nor is it the case that institutions suddenly abdicated their functions in a gust of political passion, like the famous scene from Star Wars where the Emperor Palpatine is voted uh, life powers by the Senate. And that, I threw that in for cats. <laughs> Rather, the administrative state arose through and by means of the long-term, sustained, and deliberate operation of the constitutional order of 1789. That is, the administrative state isn't an imposition on or a betrayal of that constitutional order. It is the offspring. It is the child of that order, deliberately brought into being, deliberately nurtured by the institutions of the constitution of 1789, in a long-time, sustained process. So, uh, Jerry Mashaw has shown this, especially on the legislative side. Um, the first Congress delegated wide powers to the president and began a course of bringing into being um, administrative bodies that um, would eventually uh, grow into the administrative state uh, we have today. And what's very striking about this process is that the cooperation of Congress, presidents, and courts brought into being institutions not in their own image. That is, the classical institutions create bodies that do not follow the tripartite Madisonian scheme. Uh, Daphne and I have been talking about this uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, off and on. It's very striking that we do not observe agencies modeled on the Madisonian constitution with a tripartite separation of powers. We don't see that. So what happens is, the classical institutions decided, uh, for various reasons, to bring into being uh, children, if you like, that, that don't resemble them. Well, um, here's another way of putting the point. This is a kind of just fun counterfactual. Or this is also for Cass, because we're thinking of doing a seminar next semester with counterfactuals in it. 
Suppose that uh, I wave a wand and give Gary Lawson his fantasy. So suppose that we abolish the American administrative state and somehow magically reinstate the Constitution of 1789. Uh, well, what would then happen? I think that it's very thinkable that we would have a kind of Groundhog Day of the administrative state, or a kind of eternal recurrence of the administrative state. <laughs> such that uh, the classical institutions would once again generate something like the administrative state we have today. Of course, it uh, almost certainly wouldn't have the exact same form because of uh, path dependence, but my claim is that we could well imagine, it's a thinkable possibility, not just an abstract possibility, that we would get an administrative state that serves functionally similar paths, and we would get that for the reasons we got the administrative state in the first place. And that the point of the counterfactual is A, to have fun, but B, just to underscore that the administrative state is itself a creation of the original Constitution. And there's a kind of, there's a kind of tension within the critic's prescription uh, for returning to the original Constitution uh, if the original Constitution is the source of the thing they are complaining about. Well, um, I just want to finish with uh, one more word about um, uh, abdication, the uh, idea of abdication as the uh, cause and source of the administrative state. Because this is the sort of thing I tended to hear when I was workshopping the book um, before people who are not as uh, authoritarian as I am. <laughs> they would say the administrative state uh, comes into being in a moment of abdication. And I said, well, Give me, give me an abdicating moment that is something concrete, specific, I can sink my teeth into. And one thing I heard with some frequency is Yakis. Yakis versus United States, decided in 1944. So this is the case that upholds delegation to executive officials of authority to set uh, a maximum uh, prices in wartime. And the claim is Yakis represents an uh, abdicating moment. I can't begin to see it. That is, I look at Yakis and I see a court that writes a long, detailed legal opinion that rests on a theory, a theory that the court had been elaborating at least since the late 19th century, maybe as far back as uh, Wayman G. Southard in uh, 1825. And this is a theory about the relationship between legislative and executive power. And the content of the theory, if you're interested, is that what makes uh, power executive is that it completes or carries uh, into execution or fills in the details of a, a gap-filled legislative scheme that contains a principle but doesn't contain <coughs> fully fleshed out uh, operating rules. And armed with that theory, the court upholds um, the delegation of uh, price control power. And I look at Davis and I see not an abdication of uh, governmental functions or of judicial functions, I see an exercise of judicial functions. I see a thoughtful, deliberated um, account of what law requires. Um, the critics of the administrative state have got to have some kind of theory of the legitimate mistake. That is, you can say Davis is mistaken if you hold a different account of what um, of what uh, the Constitution requires of it, what the nature of executive and legislative power, but you've got to allow room for the thought that uh, courts were mistaken, but legitimately so, because they attempted to perform their functions uh, through conventional <coughs> legal sources and in conventional legal ways. Um, and if you hold any theory of that sort, I think Yankus has got to be legitimate. If you don't hold a theory of that sort, then you have to classify uh, constitutional interpretations either as one of two things, either as correct or as betrayals of the Constitution. And that to me is a kind of fanatical perspective um, that is itself, I would argue, inconsistent with the, uh, the legal theory held by uh, our framers. Um, I'll just leave that for the discussion if anyone is interested. Okay, to sum up, uh, I think that the critics of the administrative state don't realize that when they uh, call for its uh, abolition, or at least call for us to feel bad about it, uh, 
uh, they are, uh, in a sense, impeaching their own commitments. Um, and I would uh, urge them to, to th think about the genesis of the administrative state um, and uh, then explain why uh, a realistic account of its genesis doesn't impeach their criticism. All right, I've said enough, uh, and I'll, I'll stop talking. Um, I'll just uh, finish where I began with Law's Empire. I want to underscore the nature of the claim and its, its fundamental qualification. Of course, law continues to play a role in the administrative state, both inside and outside courts. Uh, and I can talk about more with that more if people are interested. Um, so the claim is not that law has disappeared or law has no role or anything like that. The claim is, however, that law is voluntarily ceded an ever-expanding share of grain, recognizing that um, <clears throat> uh, to do so is to itself carry out in a rationally consistent way the principles and commitments that were internally generated within law uh, in cases like Crowell. So the process is for King into the court, it's a process of equilibrium that accounts for both precedents and the principles on which they're based, but the process ends with a conclusion that I think is uh, uh, anti-Vorkinian to the maximum degree, one that displaces law's empire in favor of administration. So, that's the book. Thank you. state is like Prometheus, who has to go steal fire from the gods of the Constitution, you hit on a better version <laughs> in which, um, yes, the gods uh, create and then step away to allow um, their creation to uh, uh, take center stage, as it were. I think that's, that's absolutely right. A process of, we might even call it a process of self-sacrifice. Um, the paradoxical way I try to put it in the book is that the process of seeding uh, uh, law's empire is actually a triumph of legalism. Um, but I mostly put that in, in there to tweak the Tushnet, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other, sir? Just oh, I, uh, first hand I saw was here, and, and oh, I think it's this ending. Oh, Dick, do you want to go? <laughs> yeah. Just say who you are, Dick. Uh, I'm Dick Fennell, and thank you. It's a brilliant lecture. I can't wait to read the book. The question that I have um, is one about whether there are somehow internal limits to the administrative uh, state. So I teach federal courts, and federal courts, a good deal of the discourse is about how to stop the administrative state from reaching further, further, uh, further, sometimes people try to draw a line between public rights and private rights and say the administrative state can deal with public rights but not with private rights. That doesn't <coughs> persuade me uh, very much one way or the other. But then it comes to criminal law and people say, well, we couldn't have the administrative state uh, deal with criminal uh, law matters and constitutional uh, law. So, yes, everything you say about the administrative state is true, but are there internal limits to how far it can go consistent with our ideas as well? Um, 
First of all, let me say uh, thanks for Dick. He's heroically, he's very ill, but he's here, um, and I really appreciate it. In part, I think, because uh, I'm, he's uh, happily ceded his chair to me. Uh, <laughs> I want to acknowledge him as uh, on that score as well. I'd say the following, Dick. Um, the history of uh, the advance of administrative law uh, since Crowell versus Benson is a history in which People keep identifying fallback limitations. They keep building Maginot lines and saying, well, the administrative state won't pass this line, and then it does. <laughs> right? So this is exactly the process. So the first line is between fact and law, and then there's a line between mixed questions of fact and law, and then in Chevron, Justice Stevens is horrified, even though bizarrely he wrote Chevron, he's horrified that we've uh, left over this limit and tries to reinstate it and fails, and, and the same process occurs in the other domains uh, of the book that I discuss in the book, so you're quite right to say public versus private rights is a line that in some important sense does not end up uh, holding. Um, for constitutional law, one of the uh, 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 claims in the book is uh, that for the constitutional law of procedural due process, um, there was a thought, uh, most clearly expressed in a case called Loudermill, that while substantive entitlements would be for Congress and agencies to decide, uh, constitutional procedure would be for courts exclusively to decide, and that line doesn't hold either, or so I claim, that we end up with a constitutional law of procedural due process that turns out to be substantially deferential to agencies because courts evolve uh, principles, uh, particularly uh, agency authority to allocate resources across programs that end up justifying deference to agencies even on uh, matters of procedure. The thought being that uh, procedure is just a resource, a costly resource that agencies have to allocate across programs the way other resources have to be allocated. Um, uh, on the list you gave, I would say the most promising is uh, criminal law, but of course uh, we have another work of perverse scholarship, Dan Kahn's piece about criminal law in Chevron, which um, uh, shows, to my mind, you know, in, with disquieting force, how uh, deference to prosecutorial interpretations has entered even into the criminal law. So it's not obvious to me what that line is that's uh, going to hold. Uh, maybe there will be one, but I don't see it. Oh, um, I'm sorry, I meant to mention right at the outside of the talk, uh, if anyone is interested in uh, Laws of Navigation Trump Edition, <laughs> which is something I think we should all uh, be interested in, um, we're going to have a panel about uh, exactly this topic on Tuesday with Cass and Martha. Martha's kindly uh, put it together for us, so this is going to be, you know, an occasion to talk about. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so in your rejection of the betrayal narrative, um, there's a, there's a strong flavor of a teleology there, almost an historical inevitability. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that. I mean, it seems like when you talk about the counterfactuals, you're almost asking us to bet against the field of all the other possible situations that could happen if we go back to the analogy of the 1967 conditions. And I'm wondering if you think that that pays enough respect to the historical contingencies that led to this particular outgrowth from the constitutional conditions that we, that we started with. Yeah, look, the counterfactual part I mostly threw in for fun. Um, uh, the, the main claim, of course, is not counterfactual but historical. That is, that the administrative state did, in fact, emerge as the deliberate creation, uh, offspring, if you like, of uh, the classical institutions of 1789, rather than a betrayal of them. So that's a kind of direct, actual denial of the betrayal of them. But on the counterfactual point, you're right to, of course, point out uh, contingency and path dependency. But I think the reason it makes me think my eternal recurrence or Groundhog Day counterfactual has some plausibility to it is it only requires fairly weak starting conditions to get a grip. That is, if the starting conditions include uh, a certain amount of uh, public demand for regulatory and benefits programs, if the starting conditions include 
a, a perceived inability on the part of the classical institutions to uh, supply and update regulatory and benefits programs with sufficient speed, then um, it's uh, entirely thinkable to see the classical institutions create these structures for the same reasons they created them in the first place. So that would be my idea. Um, I guess I'm wondering if there isn't a sort of uh, light anthropomorphist assumption encoded in this, in the following sense. It seems that all of the sort of descriptive claims that you're making are true, in the sense that it's obviously right that administrative agencies have come to do all of the things that you've said, they do seem inevitable. And what I'm wondering about is, why doesn't that count as law? In other words, these are government officials who are charged with making decisions about what the law requires of them. And you can imagine, uh, whether they be judges or whether they be you know, administrators of the EPA, them taking a Dworkinian approach to their job, and you can imagine them taking a different approach to figuring out what the law means, just as judges do. And so what I'm wondering is, if we just think of these people all as public officials who are all trying to figure out what the law means, and they have a division among themselves about who will have the final say, is there anything that's not law about some of those people being administrators? So why is that, if, if not, then how is law abnegated rather than just, you know, sort of move from one side to the other? I think you've, what you've done is to uh, save law's empire at the price of taking away all its subjects. So <laughs> for law's empire to be any fun, for law, the em emperor has to have subjects who are not themselves part of the imperial establishment, if that makes any sense. Uh, and Dworkin would emphatically, I think, uh, reject your vision uh, and say that um, there is an outside to law, and the outside to law is the domain of policy, and that's what uh, 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 you know, the non-judicial bodies of government do, whereas courts do principle. Um, so that's a kind of uh, high-level answer. Let me also give a low-level answer that plays off something that uh, Don Elliott uh, wrote about the Chevron Doctrine um, uh, some years ago. He was general counsel for EPA, uh, which you mentioned, and, and Don said that what uh, Chevron does is it fundamentally changes the dynamic within administrative bodies, shifting power from the lawyers to the non-lawyers, the engineers, the economists, other sorts of um, uh, technocrats and political appointees. And the way it does that is by changing law from a point estimate, like you have to get the Dworkinian right answer, to a policy space where you just have to be within the broad boundaries of some statutory scheme. And once you're within those broad boundaries, then it becomes a, a, a question not for the lawyers, but for the other types of professionals and political appointees in the room. So that's a very concrete sociological example of abnegation within agencies. So the transfer of power from one sort of professional to another. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, you had your hand up initially. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have heard this in the of Congress to overturn Chevron in Congress. I'm sorry? Oh, um, there's some noise in Congress to overturn Chevron. But I remember in the book, you mentioned that overturning Chevron wouldn't really make a difference. So I was wondering, is there, what developments would need to occur for Law's Empire to return? Or are we kind of seeing the end of history for all? Oh, history will go on, it just won't have wine. <laughs> so I know that's unthinkable, but um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm being provocative. Of course, there will be law. It just it will be a kind of mar a marginal player. Um, well, uh, so the question is about there's a move in Congress to enact something called the Separation of Powers Restoration Act of 2016, which would uh, overturn Chevron and say that uh, the text of the bill says that. Uh, courts will interpret legal questions de novo. Well, first of all, whoever drafted this bill doesn't understand the basic trick, this Queen and Parliament trick, that I said is now the core rationalization for the Chevron Doctrine, because they don't understand that saying courts interpret the law de novo is not inconsistent with saying 
that when courts decide what the law is, they decide that the law itself requires deference, right? So you've got to do more work than that in order to overrule Chevron. It's not an easy thing to kill. That's thing one. Thing two is, even if the law were enacted and it did clearly kill Chevron as a de jure matter, I think the statute makes this kind of conceptual mistake of thinking that Chevron is a, is a case, a particular case that can be overturned. It's not. It's a long-term pattern of institutional development that can't be excised by any one form of words or overturning any one precedent. I mean, the, the uh, thing I like to cite um, uh, is uh, uh, Cook, Edward Cook's uh, dictum in the House of Commons uh, in the 17th century when he said in a frustrated way, he said this is a judge who's a great opponent of the Stuart monarchs, and in the House of Commons, he said in a frustrated way, in a doubtful thing, interpretation goeth ever for the king. In a doubtful thing, interpretation goeth ever for the king, by which he meant that the king would always kind of get the benefit of the doubt when there was legal uncertainty or legal ambiguity. That's from centuries ago, right? And it's, a, I think, a progenitor of the Chevron Doctrine. And it shows that what we're dealing with is a, a kind of structural force um, that uh, you know, greatly transcends Chevron. And my prediction would be that if Chevron were overturned by statute, we would still have judicial deference to agencies on certain questions of law under complex regulatory statutes. It would just be sub rosa. Um, and uh, you know, take other names and other forms, but it would be—it's very hard to extirpate from the legal system. Uh, John and, and then Henry. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Adrian. It's a fabulous uh, talk, and uh, congratulations. Thank you. Um, so, uh, it, uh, just a. Uh, um, uh, standing as a pale version of a Gorkinian, um, would um, could one argue that, the, that, that this is not perversely Gorkinian, but just Gorkinian? Um, that is, um, I, I grant your point that um, Dworkin was curiously silent about administrative law, and for that sin he should be punished. But um, uh, there's no reason to think that that I'm aware of that Dworkin was, for example, hostile to Chevron. That you know, it was part of his picture of law's empire that there could never be deference to administrative agencies by courts in certain settings. That is, he, courts have a job to do, and they have a domain in which they operate, and they do something distinctive from agencies. Um, but I'm not sure why um, uh, why there's anything sort of undermining some of the court, at least many of the court claims of law's empire that. Um, the right answer on a set of questions of administrative law that judges should reach for all the reasons you've just said um, uh, is that deference is owed here, 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 but not there, there, there. Um, and so um, isn't, isn't this in some ways you know, um, what law's empire means in 2016 as opposed to what it meant in 1980 or 1960 or what have you? Uh, I want to say yes and no. Um, let me start with the yes part to be affirming. Um, the yes part is that I think it is true that Dworkin's own institutional commitments are fortuitous or idiosyncratic from the standpoint of his method. That is, I mean, you're exactly right in the sense that what the book does is to say, let's take the Dworkinian method and really follow that through. And if along the way we end up discarding the institutional proclivities and preferences, if you like, that's um, neither here nor there. That's a kind of that's kind of accidental. Um, so in that sense, I agree. The sense in which I don't agree at all is that uh, at least for Dworkin, the institutional commitments were uh, as central as the method. So the Dworkin vision is that. Um, with respect to uh, law, courts have an interpretive monopoly. Now, he doesn't, the dilemma is he never quite says this in a Chevron context because he doesn't talk about agencies at all, but he says it with respect to, uh, you know, he has these formulations like uh, political bodies, non-judicial bodies, and so on. He's clearly thinking of courts and other 
uh, in his deep commitment is the court should have this monopoly on legal interpretation that works out um, uh, law's integrity through uh, principle and uh, faith. So in that sense, we are discarding a core Wartinian commitment. And I think Wartin would not at all be happy with the Queen in Parliament version of law's empire um, that I think we've arrived at. <coughs> I think I was, I oh, I thought I, Henry was next. Yeah. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, about 15 years ago, I think that uh, Randy Perenboom wrote an article uh, titled, Is that Kudita and Rowan's White Rose Empire? So basically, he imagined a scenario that, I mean, that Hercules met with Atlas, neither, I mean, Greek Titans here, because, I mean, uh, Dworkin's edition, Herculean Judges. And then there's a counter character here. So I want to imagine also here, I think that I wonder if you envision also things that kind of come in the battle scenario between the Hercules and the Isabel Empire, and so the regulator is another kind of a character also. Thank you. Wait, so, so I didn't, so the idea was is this a narrative of a coup? Where the Titans. a scenario of a coup, I mean. The, the, where the Titans defeat Hercules? Yeah. <laughs> No, absolutely not. So this is right. This is um, just, I love all the classical analogies <laughs> flying around. But this is exactly, uh, I think Martha's seen, seen deep into my heart that this is not, um, this is not a coup narrative. It's a narrative of uh, a kind of self-sacrifice on the part of the, it's not Hercules, it's the gods. Uh, <laughs> namely the constitutional institutions of 1789. Yeah, no, the coup narrative is what I intend to deny. Okay. Uh, and, and that's what law students imbibe so quickly. I don't know how. Uh, <laughs> uh, I want to ask about a, a theory of reasons. Uh, do you, in your book or in your theoretical reflections, uh, have a preferred uh, explanation for the continuing growth of the administrative state and expansion of deference? And if so, is it related to external changes in society, economy, yeah. technology, wealth levels, and so forth, perception of problems? Or, or is it some other thing? I would use an analogy. Is your idea that this is just a contingent, accidental, highly path dependent development? Or is it more like a genetically based thing, your, your child analogies, you know, some plant just growing up into a, a beautiful or ugly flower? <laughs> You know, because of its con original constitution, or is it more like rapid uh, evolution in response to the external environment changes? <coughs> the sort of thing that we could expect to see in any developing economy and society over time as it increases in scale and complexity. Right. Um, <clears throat> I think it uh, basically the latter, but let me say something about viewing it at a short time scale or a long time scale. So we view it at a short time scale with respect to any particular, oh, I don't know, uh, organic statute or creation of a new administrative program. What we see is just a lot of variety. That is, some of them are created for what we might call, you know, good stories. Um, and some of them are created uh, through all sorts of uh, versions of bad stories to suppress competition or rent seeking and so on. So at, at short time scales, we see you know, different things going on. If we step back and look both at longer time scales and across legal systems, I think we see a kind of striking convergence in the sense that we don't observe, at least in the Anglo-American world, which is the, the world I know decently well, we don't observe um, any polity that um, has not evolved a robust administrative state in some version of robust principle of deference to reasonable agency decisions. Um, and that convergence suggests to me that what's going on is that um, developing economies um, and developing polities in some sense constrain the path of the law, not to be identical, but constrain it within a certain chain. Yeah, sure. Oh, Jody, hi. hi. Thank you. I now, oh, you now put me in mind of at least two things I have to go talk about in my Greg on Monday, so thanks a lot. <laughs> um, but my question is, what, what relevance, where, what do you make 
of the fact that the court has crafted a doctrine that it can expand and contract at its whim. So one can subscribe wholeheartedly to Chevron as did Justice Scalia and then use it very little, or rather decide you know what the law is very clearly at step one. Or you could say you're going to defer, but then it turns out the zone of things that make an agency interpretation unreasonable some suddenly grows and step two becomes uh, something at your disposal to strike down the agency's interpretation too. So there is this moment right now, arguably, of contraction, um, sort of a response to perceived overreach of the agencies that you can find in several decisions. So what what about that? That the mm -hmm. you know they ask for constraints within administrative law, but the constraints really come from the court applying Chevron. Yeah, I'd say a couple of things. I, this is an important set of questions that I that I address in the book, and, and maybe uh, should have addressed more in the talk. I think it's it's completely legitimate. And the doctrinal background, for those who might not know, of what Jody's saying is a few recent cases that apply this uh, kind of major questions uh, exception to the Chevron doctrine. I take it that's was something on your mind. I'd say a few things. One is that the main effect of Chevron may not be. Uh, observable in the litigated cases at all, uh, especially the ones that go to judgment in the Supreme Court and result in an opinion. The main effect may be occur through the kind of law of anticipated reactions as uh, people thinking about challenging agencies think, you know, how good are my prospects? And if there's an obvious ambiguity or an obvious gap in the statute, they're less likely to uh, try to do uh, anything to overturn the agency decision. And that yields no, no record. Um, the second thing is, um, I would uh, you know, just keep an eye on the distinction between what the Supreme Court does and what it says lower courts are to do. That is, um, a lot of the bite of Chevron does not come in the occasional great case that makes bad law like King versus Burwell. It comes in the routine quotidian activity of lower courts, the DC Circuit and so on, that. Uh, apply Chevron, you know, three times a day in a kind of ordinary way, in uh, a rather deferential way, without any um, fancy uh, major questions stuff going on. And finally, I'd say, to broaden the time scale like I do with Bob, if we go back to 1932 and Powell versus Benson, I think what we see is an analogy for deference to agency legal interpretations is like the stock market. That is, we see a rising trend over time that's not inconsistent with local temporary corrections, with you know falls and so on, but the, the overall pattern is inevitably in one direction with a kind of zigzag around the trend line. Um, and that's how I see uh, uh, the major questions uh, stuff. Is a, is, it's, a, it's like a stock market correction in <laughs> <like> 1987. <laughs> um, I, think we'll I don't want to cut, yeah. The yeah. And there's just one more thing that needs to be done, which is, uh, I don't have a metaphor, I just have a chair. <laughs>